Everyone was expecting trouble. Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, was seething with protest and counter-protest. At stake, the future of the president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Many Haitians want him to resign. He's right in the middle between the groups. These guys on this side are shouting, Aristide, Aristide. The people on the other side are shouting, Abba, Aristide. We're just down with Aristide. So. The president's supporters soon had reinforcements. An organized gang from one of the capital's many slums. They were in the mood to kill. Haiti is collapsing into lawlessness, and its people are turning on each other. They're shooting again. Throughout Haiti's history, military dictators have used terror to control an impoverished population. These days, there's democracy, but still no peace. Haiti's poor were once united by hatred for their despotic rulers. Now, with economic collapse and political disintegration, the poor are attacking the poor. That right at the other end of the street, the people we can see that's actually the opposition demonstrating. And that's where the shots went off. OK, we're going, we're going. Haitians hoped democracy would bring prosperity. A decade later, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere has become even poorer. This is the general hospital. Some of the president's supporters had been injured in the shootout. To get them immediate treatment, gang members took over the hospital by force. So in this room alone, there are four people with gunshot wounds, which they obtained on the street outside the hospital. Nobody in the hospital dared oppose the gang's demands. The opposition alleges these groups, the Chimères, have been created and armed at the government's instigation. The gang instructed us to say these were innocent victims. After some hours, a courageous woman asked the gang members to respect the work of the hospital and leave. She was shouted down. It wasn't a good day to need treatment. Eighty percent of Haitians are without work. One in five children die before they reach five. Every night there are power cuts. Haiti is a country that doesn't work. The next morning, everyone feared another gun battle. I joined students demonstrating against gang violence. At the place where a student had been shot the week before, they held a lament in his memory. You'd think the opposition would capitalize on this anger, but they are divided and Haitians feel powerless. They're shouting, we're tired, we're tired, we're tired, we're tired of ca counting dead people. Suddenly, the police sealed off the streets around the demonstrators. A few blocks away, the president was about to make a show of strength. Many may hate him, but Jean-Bertrand Aristide 
remains Haiti's most charismatic politician. Born in the slums, this former priest was the country's first democratically elected leader. Aristide's impoverished followers still believe he will lift them out of misery. But the government's record is one of mismanagement and corruption. America and Europe have blocked aid following allegations his supporters rigged elections. Protected by his foreign bodyguards, the president has been touring the country, blaming poverty on the international aid embargo. Haiti, he says, is the victim of economic apartheid. Aristide is just getting tears after tears after tears as he re-emphasizes again and again that Haiti was the first black-led republic in the world. But the poor are turning their backs on politics and starting to live according to different rules. I'd heard beyond the capital, many Haitians are pledging their loyalty not to political parties, but to powerful gangs, many run by criminals. We're on our way to Gonaïve, a city said to be under siege due to the fighting of two gang leaders, Metaye and Tatoun. Metaye's followers had broken him out of jail back in July. I wanted to see if I could meet him. Gonaïve is 70 miles to the north. OK, we've just driven along this road and there's this body lying there dead and our driver is saying that you can see clearly from the marks on his chest that he's been tortured. Everybody's just driving past. I'm just ringing the police. Our driver said they won't do anything anyway, but the least we can do is try. So maybe this guy going to be there until dog eat them. We arrived at the outskirts of Gonaïve. So all these people out here are waiting to go to Port-au-Prince, but it seems there's absolutely no public transport available because of the rise of the fuel prices. The public transport system appears to have broken down entirely. Not only had the price of fuel risen steeply, there wasn't enough of it. A pickup driver explained Gonaïve was a town without law. He's saying, firstly, there's no police, nobody's police in the country, but also with shortages like this, people will just turn against each other because they will fight each other to get to petrol. He's saying the problem in Haiti at the moment is that nobody's taking responsibility for anything. The people in government don't, so even if you want to complain about the situation now, about the fuel price, where do you go to? Where do you voice your anger? Shots going off at the filling station. So what the guy on the pickup was saying is probably true. The situation is so tense that a lot of things could happen even this afternoon. Further on, we came to one of the front lines in the war between the gangs struggling to control this city. I was told the gang, the cannibal army, had attacked this neighborhood to force its inhabitants to switch allegiances. 
Everybody who could was running away, fleeing. Those who weren't fast enough were pulled out of the houses. Him and his brother were beaten up, and um, the cannibal army took all their belongings, threw it out on the street, and set it on fire. Why did they not take the bullet out? This man said that he'd been shot during the raid. So this is an X-ray of the man's body who's been hit by a bullet, and you can clearly see the bullet there. Um, he's very lucky. He, lit it, huh? he was lucky. So the attackers also came here with a machete. Yeah. Whoa. So we're in one of the houses that was destroyed and looted by the cannibal army. The people obviously don't live here anymore and have run away. They were saying that most of the people who lived on this street and whose houses were destroyed are now living with relatives or neighbors. That night, our driver navigated us through the maze of barricades that mark gang territories. There's not a single person driving down these streets. I wanted to track down Amiou Metaillé, widely believed to be the leader of the cannibal army. On the edge of town, there was a voodoo festival. There, I hoped to find someone who knew where Metaille was. A mix of ancient African beliefs and Christianity, voodoo is the one thing that unites most Haitians. A government official promised to help me find Mitaye. Eventually, I met the town engineer, Emmanuel Longchamp. He said he'd introduce me to the gang leader the next day. I was told to come to the local government offices the very next morning. The cannibal army had burned the town hall. The government offices were in a bar. Bonjour. Emmanuel was in his office. Hi. Very well. How are you? It's a pleasure meeting you. Oh, we're not coming too early, but we thought we'll take you up on your on my offer. On your offer. I was told to wait while he looked for Metaille. If he's really going over there for us, then we could get an in to meet somebody who's very difficult to meet. Ah. Yeah. He's just spotted Metaille, so we're just going to go over and see if we can fix an interview. Bonjour, je m'appelle Juliana. It was so surreal. He was a wanted man, yet we'd been introduced by a government official. He agreed to meet me later. Okay. And then I will, we can interview him at home, at his place. I was beginning to realize that this was Metaillé's town, not President Aristide's. That afternoon, we drove into the cannibal army's heartland. 20,000 people live in the slum district of Rabotou. It's where Metaille gets his foot soldiers. By the standards of Rabotou, Metaille's home is a palace. His place was watched over by gang members. Bonjour. Ça va? In the days of military dictatorship, 
Metaille organized the slum self-defense force. He was now Rabotou's ruler. The opposition says the self-defense force has become his well-paid militia. He denies it. I was just wondering how people here in Rabotou make their living, and, and Amur is saying that most of the men are actually going out and sea fishing, and the women are selling small things. Metaille was always close to President Aristide. But he told me how last year, under international pressure, Aristide ordered his arrest on murder charges. Aristide had miscalculated. He had the support of the population on his side. And when the people heard that he was in jail, he, they actually took a bulldozer and bulldozed down the walls of the jail. And he went free together with about another 150 inmates. Metaillé doesn't expect to return to jail. And Amur was just saying he's got the full support of the population. If anybody would come in from the outside, political opponents, other gangs, he's got so much support from people here that nobody could take him out. People here have no respect for the government. These people are saying if they're trying to arrest Amur, they'll have to arrest absolutely everybody, the whole population, because that's how much support he has. I'm being asked whether he's the only person who can offer that kind of protection to the community, saying, at the moment, it's me, and maybe there will be another one, and maybe I'm replaceable, but for the time being, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> to keep Metaillé on their side, the government has given his brother a plum job. So this is the port area where, where Amur and his brother are just taking us because Amur's brother is actually the second in command of the port. It's a government-owned port, but the cannibal army provides the security. Metaillé's brother is in charge of handing out jobs. Are you the person who employs people? Um, yes, I'm, I'm supposed to do that. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So between you so and came, your brother came, Amur, you're really yeah. important people in the community yes, because yes. you're the two people yes. who are handing out the jobs to everybody here in yes. Rabotor. The two, two, two brothers is the father of Gonai. <laughs> so you're the first family of Rabotor? Yeah. <laughs> Metaillé says the port is run strictly by the book. But locals told me it's a smuggler's paradise. And Metaillé admits taking a 25% cut on all goods. Suddenly, we saw uniforms. It was the city's chief of police and his bodyguards. He should have arrested Metaillé. Instead, he asked if we had permission to film. Metaillé's brother explained we were his guests. The police chief and his men backed off. It was a demonstration of where the real power in this town lies. going to see if the director of the police force is going to give us an interview. Oops. <laughs> to my surprise, he agreed. I asked why he hadn't arrested Metaillé. Il y a eu une commission qui a été mise sur pied, c'est la commission pour la libération de la minorité. Metaillé has not been arrested because order hasn't been received from the justice ministry. For his jailbreak, the civilian population has to be blamed. Um, but until they receive orders as the police, uh, they can do absolutely nothing about it. Power had shifted from the government to the gangs. The violence is such that even his office has been attacked, there are bullet holes in the blinds. This neighborhood was ruled by a gang that's allied itself to the political opposition. They were protesting against the rise in fuel prices. 
We've hardly left the center of town and there's already the first roadblock up, fire in front of us. The police did not dare attack the cannibal army, but this gang was weaker. We're just finding out that one local person got actually killed this morning where the roadblocks were being built. People say he was nothing but a bystander who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and he was hit by a police bullet. Does, is the person who got killed, is he from this area? Yeah. Do you know his family? Yes. Yeah. The dead man was Zarel Volny. I went to meet his family. This lady is actually the sister of the person who got killed this morning, and she said she sent her brother out to get something from the streets. He went down to the streets, met a few friends, and suddenly this group of people heard bullets. Her brother shouted at the friends to throw themselves onto the ground, and then it was her brother who was hit by a bullet. This man was next to him. He blamed a special police unit, but they deny responsibility. He says he wouldn't be able to identify the policeman who shot his friend, but he does know it was the special unit because of the grey uniforms they were wearing. Sorel's sister said, if we went to the morgue, we'd see that it was no stray bullet that had killed her brother. Our arrival caused consternation. We're just being told that we have to come with an official paper, which the family was given this morning. Now, these ladies haven't got the paper. But the family insisted on their right to show us the body. They couldn't find a lawyer who'd act for them. There would be no post-mortem. Well, the fact that it was a stray bullet can definitely be ruled out. The hole is straight in his forehead. For many Haitians, the message is simple. Join a gang, but make sure it's powerful enough to protect you. We were getting under the skin of life in Gonaive. It seemed we'd been asking too many questions. Gang members and local officials who'd been friendly now became hostile. We've been spending a lot of time in town, and every time we even saw the tip of a gun, people have been hiding guns from us. And suddenly word is spreading that we went to the morgue yesterday and we filmed Zorel's body. And just over the last few minutes, people were walking up and down, displaying guns in front of us openly, and I think that's a clear signal. It was time to leave. We just managed to pick up somebody who knows an alternative way out because the roadblocks are still in action, so we couldn't even get out of town that way. Um, but this man in front of me says he knows another way. Across the globe, poor people are searching for new identities that offer a sense of belonging in a hostile world. The gangs give Haiti's disaffected people just such an identity. But the future they offer is a desolate one. Thank you.